So good afternoon, happy Thursday, and welcome to today. We're going to look at model-based definition and the GD&T advisor that is an extension for PTC CREO. My name is Rob Romanoski. I'm the Director of Sales Operations for 3HTI. And joining me on the panel today is Jeff Gavio, our Director of Marketing, as well as Paul Dye, who is a solutions consultant and applications engineer with PTC's Virtual Center of Excellence. So Paul's gonna be leading the presentation and the demo today. If you have any questions during the webinar, please put them in the chat box. And we're hoping to get through this in about 20, 25 minutes, including question and answers. So basically the GD&T advisor is something that literally gives your model a better definition. And while it may take a little bit more time to do in the engineering process, your people downstream, especially those in manufacturing, will thank you because they're absolutely going to get a better model to work with um, downstream. And I know in the past that um, using this type of tool um, has been a little bit more difficult or challenging, not this specific tool, but GD and T tools in general. And Sigmetrics has developed something with PTC that's a lot easier to use. Um, and will absolutely improve your productivities overall. So without further ado, Paul, why don't you take it away and lead the charge? All right, sounds good. And you can see my screen okay? You can, yes, uh, we can. All good? Awesome. All right, well, first and foremost, thank you very much for having me on, Rob, and thank you everybody for hopping on. We have a decent bit to go over today, but still gonna try to keep it high level, but still make sure that we hit on everything, so. Primarily going to be talking about the GD&T advisor, as well as what we're doing in the space of model-based definition. Two very big topics, two areas that more and more people are starting to build into, wanting to learn about, and wanting to standardize in their processes. So I'll go through and explain a lot of this, but it starts first and foremost with why we even work with model-based definition or the GD&T advisor, right? And it starts over on the side of 2D prints, right? And if you've worked with these before, you know, they're very costly, a lot of times also incomplete whenever it comes to you transferring your design information. It's really hard work a lot of the time, difficult to get all your information into there. And if you've seen any of these types of drawings before, they're very visually challenging to read, let alone get any type of useful information out of them, right? Reading these types of drawings is almost like a skill that seems to be dying off nowadays. But for a lot of people, it's the only way that you have to transfer your designs out to the real world, right? And Back in the day, we kind of thought that 3D modeling could be a solution to that, but those models have problems as well, right? It's challenging to put all that information on there, understand the dimensions, the tolerances that go into the part, uh, because there's a lot of details, there's a lot of drawing information. We can't just have that all hanging out around the model and standards, right? These are things that you have to be able to work with, adapt to, because as the standards, whether it be ASME or ISO, as they change, you have to be able to change along with them. And looking at it from a gd &T perspective, it's a very great way of doing this. It's a very robust and effective way of putting your design intent into your parts and assemblies, but it can be very complex as well, right? But for gd &T to be useful, it has to be complete, it has to most importantly be correct as well, right? So if your models that you're working with aren't fully defined, you don't have all these laid out, or worse, you have things laid out, but done incorrectly, well, that kind of defeats the purpose, right? So these are all things that we built into CREO, and especially around the world of model-based definition and your gd &T work. We've done a lot of work to really give you solutions to combat all those different challenges. And it starts just with the world of model-based definition, right? This is something that you're just working with out of the box with CREO nowadays, and we've done a lot of enhancements and a lot of work to improve what you're doing in that sense. Things like datum feature symbols, datum targets, GTALs, these are all things that have had so many different enhancements, essentially just making it faster, easier, and even when it gets more complex, a lot more accurate for putting these things onto the models themselves. And Creo is very intelligent. It knows if you're missing a component or doing something invalid, it's gonna let you know, right? So has all the standards built into it something that you, the user, don't really have to worry about on a day-to-day -day basis. You can kind of just let Creo watch out for those things, right, and let you know if there's any issues. Also around annotations, these are another area that we've had a ton of enhancements around, right? So if you go through and lay out different dimensions and you have a surface change, let the system warn you about it. You can go through and edit any of your annotations. 
And especially around laying out these types of 3D annotations, one thing that you're going to want to be using here is combination states. So this is when you're viewing your models or assemblies in different views, orientation, view states. For example, here in the model, you can see what you're able to do is essentially, if you want to define this inner diameter, right, that might not be very normally clear on a 3D drawing, what you could do is set the outside to more of a translucent um, view through the model so you can much more clearly understand the dimensions that you're laying out. And wrapping up around here again you have a lot of enhancements around text, fonts, symbols, and I mentioned the standards right as they keep evolving Creo is evolving right alongside them so anything that you're working with from that perspective is all going to be supported. And finally if you're wondering hey well if I wanted to lay out dimensions and tolerances over on the 3D models themselves how are my downstream users in the shop floor or whoever is going to be consuming us? How are they actually viewing up these models? Well, there's tons of different ways to go through and pull these models up. You have things like the step AP 242 files that are basically a standard in the world of model based definition. You also have Creo view, which is a free option for basically anyone to work with. So essentially how you're going to be working with these downstream is very simple. Right. But one of the big things that I want to mention around this here too, is that we have this, uh, GDT advisor extension, which is almost in my eyes, sort of a given and almost should be a standard for a lot of companies. If you're working into the world of model based definition, this is going to be extremely useful, right? And what it is as its core is essentially a tool that's going to give you expert guidance on the application of your GDT as well as a validation that it's been done correctly. Right, so as a start, it's really a guide for your users, right? So say, for example, you go to apply certain tolerance, it's gonna give you suggestions based off of the part of the feature that you selected. And it's also not gonna give you options to apply a tolerance if it would be invalid for a certain feature, right? So it lets you know which features are fully constrained, which ones are unconstrained, somewhere in the middle. I'm gonna go through and show what all this looks like. But one thing that it is also doing is educating people, right? So if you get a message in your advisor tree as saying you did something wrong or something might be giving you an error, you can get context into it, allows you to learn about it, get a better understanding of all the changes that you're making. Mentioned around standards, this is also another tool that keeps up to date with any of those latest ASME or ISO standards. And with really a lot of the different tools that we have in Creo, it's seamlessly connected in with what you're doing from a Creo parametric standpoint. You work in a streamlined model tree environment. And if you also had any existing annotations that you had previously in the model, that's also something that you'd be able to add in and work with going forward. All right, and one thing here as well that I'm going to mention on here is that we also do have an advanced version of the GDNT advisor, and this is giving you a few different things here. So first and foremost, it's allowing you to take in those previously existing Creo annotations and also letting you know whether or not you need to do any corrective action on them. And one of the other big things here as well is that it's letting you work into the areas of assemblies as well, right? So multiple different areas that you're going to get access to into that. All right, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and switch over here into our Creo environment so you can see what some of this looks like. So first half of the demo is going to be around just basic model based definition work. And then the second half will be more into what we're doing with the GDNT advisor. So for our demonstration here, we're going to be working with this gripper link from one of our designs. And I'm going to go ahead and start off in our annotate mode. So this is a mode that is used for keeping different sets of annotations grouped together here in a clean, easy to use environment. So first thing that I'll do is use our geometric tolerance button. So say we want to apply a GTOL to our top surface. It's just as easy as clicking on that area that we want to apply it and dragging it out so we can see it. After that, we might want to go through and apply a geometric characteristic with that. In this case, we'll do that for our flatness tolerance and it's done, right? Quite often after this as well, we'll have to add on a datum tag. And it's really the same process of defining the surface that we want to tie that to, and we're good to go. And you can go through and work with that. You can change how that tag looks, where it's located, if it has or doesn't have an elbow, right? The whole process is fast and easy, good to update, and just keep moving on to other parts of the model. And that's what we'll do here. We'll go ahead and look at our second annotation set that we have here. And maybe we want to work with a dimension around this center bore here in the middle. Right, so starting out with that, we can go ahead and drag out our dimension here. So we can see it a little bit easier. 
and we'll begin by adding in a tolerance to that value. So with that, you can put that up, show a plus or minus for the range, you're able to take those values set to really whatever you need to. And from there, I can go ahead and add in a geometric tolerance right on top of that dimension. In this case, maybe I know what I want to add in, maybe this will be a perpendicularity. And then we can just simply go through, put in whatever values we need, define which datum that we want to reference, and everything's going to update for us. Also, very often in this process, you're going to need symbols as well. So you can see here that we add in our diameter symbol. We have a very full library of symbols there. You could add in your favorites or most recently accessed ones as well. In this case, it might be a maximum material condition. And say you were putting in a symbol that wouldn't make sense for the scenario, it would throw you an error, says that, hey, you probably don't want to add that in. That would be invalid in that. So it's just making sure that those values are going to be correct. And same as we did before, we might need to add in a datum tag. So for this one, we'll go ahead and pin that on the width line. And also add in the services that we want to reference with that datum. And we'll be good to go there. All right. So now that we've finished up our definition on that center board, we can move to define some of the mounted holes over here on the outsides. So we'll start by getting our diameter dimension here and just dragging that away from the model. And as we did with that other hole, we can go lay out a range or even define how many decimal places that should be defined with that as well. And we can also make some different additions to those tolerances. So for example, since we have four of those holes, we could just simply show that in our call out. And again, as you can see, the process is pain free. So go ahead and add in a GTOL for that as well. In this case, it might be our position call out. So we can go ahead and define that here. And we'll go ahead and set those values up, check out the references. Again, this one will be for our datum A and probably also have a reference for a datum B as well. And in addition to all that, you can also add in any additional text to the sides of those callouts for any more information that you want to add in. Right, so in this case here, for whoever sees this call out, we want to make sure that it's referencing all four of those internal surfaces where those holes are located. And we can also select those on the model itself to define those surfaces as reference. So again, the callouts that you're laying out there, they're not just numbers, letters, there's really intelligence built into that as well. All right, we'll go ahead and move into our final annotation page here. So we can take a look at what that looks like over there as well. And I mentioned the process works perfectly for any annotations that you already had laid out and also for dimensions as well, right? So for the surface here, maybe I need to set up a perpendicularity with reference to datum A. You can go ahead and define that. And we can also, uh, also open up our additional text here and remove any of the things that we had pulled over from the initial one, right? The call-out just simply keeps the info from the last one, but it makes it very quick to repeat some of those call-outs. And now we can go through and see some of our options for building out the dimensions here on the model. And this is also very easy to do as well, right? So very easy to go through, define exactly where you want that to reference. Very easy to go through and define any of the decimal places with that, right? Lay out exactly which of the services that you want to reference. So for example, here, maybe you want to show the maximum dimension from one side to the next. You can go ahead and define that as well. And similar to what we did with the prefix from before, I can also lay out a suffix and say that that's going to be a reference. All right, so again, once we have all that, I'm pretty much good for working over on the model-based definition side of things. Just wanna kind of show you what that looks like here from the context of Creo. And now I can show you what it looks like to save these off, right? You can do that into a number of different file types. Like I mentioned, we have new options around the step file, specifically the AP242 to include all those different annotations that we built out. And now the file saved off, it's ready to be used downstream for whatever purpose is necessary, right? So this is really just taking into account all the standard model-based definition features that we have from within the context of Creo. But now what I want to move into more is on the GD&T advisor side of things. So everything that I did there from before was honestly just up to me to know exactly what I need to be doing, what things I need to be adding in, and also not a lot of really validation than what I'm doing is correct, right? No guidance on exactly what I should be doing. So this is really where the GD&T advisor starts to play a role, right? It's giving us expert guidance on the application of our GD&T and then also that validation that it's been done correctly. So it's just another application that we have up at the top here. And just kind of show you how it works, we'll go ahead and start with our first surface up at the top here and pick what we want it to do. 
right? So whenever we go ahead and select that, and we can see whenever I look at that drop down, it's actually not giving me the option to lay out any of those other characteristics, right? Because it knows that, hey, those would be invalid for that particular scenario that you laid out or what you selected. So in my case here, it tells us what it recommends. In this case, it would be a flatness tolerance. And now the system will build out our data feature. And we can simply keep moving on from there. And I can really do the same thing as I was doing before. You know, if I wanted to build out the upper and lower tolerance ranges for one of these holes, you could just do that. And in this case, we can see what the system is going to recommend for us as far as a characteristic, right? It says that uh, perpendicularity would be a good one to utilize here. And then we can go through, set the values for that as well, right? Set the material conditions, and then we'll go ahead and use that for another datum feature here. So this will be our datum feature B in this case. Right, and once those annotations are built out, they just work just like standard annotations, right? You can still go through and do everything that you could have otherwise, but really the GDNT advisor makes it so much faster for getting laid out. And even though we started here in the GDNT advisor, you could go back and forth between the standard environment here. It really works both ways. All right, so working on our next feature on the side here, we want to define a diameter for that hole. And we'll go ahead and define a range for that as well. And when we look back here into our conditions, we can see the advisor recommends the position characteristic. One thing to note is that you could still use any of those other tolerances as long as they're valid, but otherwise we can just use the one that the system recommends. And we could also, like you can see here, lay out multiple different tolerances. So in this case, I could define a parallelism for this feature in reference to datum A. And once that's done, we just check to run the GTOL, and now we actually have a composite GTOL. So again, not only fast and easy, but most importantly, accurate, right? That's really what you want. Make sure that we're doing the right things there. All right, building out another one here, we can come over to the left-hand side here and start to define this hole down at the bottom. And for this one, we're just going to need a positional tolerance. Go ahead and give that a value, give it a reference, specified range. And because we don't need a new datum there, we just accept it as is, and we can just simply drag that out so we can see it clearly. Another thing that we can see here, zooming in on one of these holes, right? We obviously know that this is a pattern, but the system can also recognize that it's a pattern, right? So what we can do here is apply whatever tolerance is necessary to one of those and then have that positional tolerance, in this case, applied to all eight of those surfaces automatically. So once we've laid out our symbols and our values, we just go ahead and accept that, and it's going to run and apply that to all eight of those surfaces. And same as before, we'll just put that call out into a position that we can easily read, give our downstream users a bit more information as well if we need to, so we can state that this reference here is used in two different places, just add that into our additional text. All right, and after we finish that call out, we can also check over in our advisor tree over on the left here as well. And one thing that we know is that it's actually giving us a warning, right? Saying that we have a zero tolerance that isn't allowed. Well, Sure enough, I must have forgot to put in a tolerance there. So I can just go ahead back up into there, look at the options that we have for that, just simply define a range for that, give us our values. And once we accept those changes, we can check the advisor tree. And now we have a valid dimension. Just make sure that the error message is going to go away there. And it's always checking those things out, just making sure that we're defining or constraining everything correctly. Right. And what we're looking at here now, as you can see, the constraint state that everything's in. So anything that is currently highlighted in green, these are surfaces or features that are fully constrained. Any of the surfaces that you see there in gray are going to be unconstrained and just really helping me to fully understand where exactly I'm at with the model. All right, so we can go through, check that out and see where we need to work into, which areas are most important for us. Uh, one thing that we can also look at here is over in our properties. What we're able to see is that we can have the model controlled by an overall note as well. So in this case, maybe I want to have a general profile of say 0 0.002 and add that tolerance in, and that's going to add in a note up at the top. And as you can see anywhere now in the model, it's all constrained by a surface profile that you have the note. And of course, once you're done in the GDT advisor, keep all those callouts that we created and we can get right back into modeling, right? You just move things around here if you want to, make those different features look exactly how you want them to. Here, if you see an annotation that happens to be upside down based on how you defined it, very quick to go through, 
change that orientation up. So very fast and easy to get those looking the way that you want. Right. And once we're finished up there, we have a great geometrically tolerance part, right? Something that we can save off and move on with the design. All right, so again, there's a lot of different things that we really covered there. And just to wrap up here, really, a lot of the stuff that you're getting from this is first and foremost, giving you a ton of different benefits. We're seeing people use this all the time. People are reducing scrap and failure that you typically see just from poor communication, right? If you were to underdefine something, it leads to guesswork over on the manufacturing side and oftentimes failed products, right? So that's something that we're avoiding a lot more of. You're going to be a lot more productive, right? It's really just in general, much easier to build these out from scratch, make edits, share them off. And really from a gd and advisor standpoint, it's first and foremost really helping to educate your designers, right? Educated designers at the end of the day are gonna be better designers, right? You're able to know exactly what each feature is doing. And if you don't, you have a quick and easy way to figure that out. And just overall improving the quality of your designs. You're validating at every stage of the process. So if something's wrong, you want to be immediately know that, right? So well before you would ever hit the save button or send this out to someone down on the shop floor. All right, and I think that really covers just about everything that I wanted to touch on today. There's a ton more around the, all these different capabilities that you could really go through and explore and start to work into a process. But really, I just wanted to take about 20 minutes here today to give you that overview and have you have a little bit more of an in-depth look at it. So. With that, I can pass it over to you, Rob, see if we have any questions or anything that you want to add over from your end. Excellent. Excellent, Paul. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, if anybody has any, uh, wants to see a more detailed demo, because we're, you know, kind of just scratching the surface with this, uh, feel free to respond to the email that I sent you uh, with the invitation to this webinar. I received those, or you can email us at info, info at 3hti.com. We will get the uh, recording up within the next day or so, and we will send everyone um, who registered a copy uh, or a link to our, to our YouTube page to view a copy of the recording at their leisure. So Paul, thanks again for uh, doing this, and we look forward to seeing everybody next week where we're gonna take a look at uh, the interactive surface design extension within Creo. Thanks again, everyone, and have a great day.